I'm Scott L. Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I was having a conversation with Eric Peterson from Generic Expats, and we were talking about the complications that come from attempting to compare the cost of living between different locations, and specifically not the total cost of living, but the cost of individual products, and why this presents a lot of really big complications when it comes to discussing these things and, and understanding them for people who may be looking at moving to different countries. And so I want to talk a little bit about how we do those comparisons as people who are interested in relocation, who talk to a lot of people about relocation, who move around and live around the world. How do we do these things? How do we think about it? Because I think there's a lot of nuances that a lot of people may not be familiar with because it's not something you do very often. We're going to talk about that right after the bump. This topic came up because we were looking at a discussion on another uh, channel where someone was saying that things are cheaper in one country than another, but gave no information as to how he came about that conclusion, which is a common thing to do. And if you're looking at some websites, Numio, uh, uh, Numbio uh, comes to mind, they have a pretty good means of doing a comparison, and it's still essentially useless, but they at least make a really good concerted effort, and they say that they do comparisons, for example, taking a couple of drip coffee and comparing that in different places and that gives you a basis for price comparison and it is useful however it's important to understand that in some places like the united states you may find that drip coffee is very standard it's the norm you can get it absolutely anywhere and it is the cheapest standard morning drink that you can get if you were to go to italy you would find the drip coffee is very exclusive it's something only kept for expats in most cases and many shops won't even make it they don't have the equipment for it so it ends up being very costly even though much higher quality at least by many standards coffee is available nearly everywhere at a fraction of the normal u.s price how do you compare those two things they're essentially non-comparable, even though it's both coffee in both places. But it's two different ways of serving coffee. So if you just want to get a coffee, Italy is going to win in price. If you want to compare on quality, Italy is going to win as well for the quality you get for the same amount of money by most evaluations of quality. But if it comes to, I specifically want this one very specific type of coffee, then the U.S. is going to win because Italy doesn't really make that. And this comes to mind because I recently was in Bolivia, uh, and Bolivia takes a lot of culture from Argentina, uh, and in that region, drinking coffee is less popular than up here in North America, right? And when you're down in, in that Central and Southern South America, you have this challenge that if you want to compare coffee, and certainly you can get coffee, no problem, right? You have a bit of the Italian problem that they don't necessarily do coffee in the way that you're expecting, so that may cause it to be more expensive if you're trying to use an American basis of comparison. Of course, if you reverse that and took it from the Italian perspective and tried to see what it would cost do things in the U.S., it would flip the cost and make the U.S. wildly more expensive because, you know, you I go to a, a local diner. Oh, they don't do, you know, espresso. I have to go to a Starbucks. And not that Starbucks is that overpriced, but it's going to be a lot more expensive than your cheap diner coffee. Whereas if you were getting espresso in Italy, you can go to the equivalent of a local diner, a cafetina or whatever, and get really cheap, high quality espresso very easily. So which one we use as the base will basically choose which place is going to be perceived as expensive and which one is going to be perceived as cheap. If we're then looking at South America, I've got a lot of dogs here. I don't know if we'll be able to cut them out. Uh, of the, the audio. Uh, in Bolivia, when I was there, right, did people have coffee in the morning? You could get it, certainly. But the more common thing, and certainly as you move south, even more common, is mate or herbal tea, basically. So mate is very cheap in that region because everyone drinks it all the time. And they have traditions around drinking it that is cheaper than the way we drink it in most of North America. Here we tend to get tea bags and, and soak it, and it's a, an expensive thing. It comes in boxes. And down there, they have huge areas of the grocery store selling it because it's a thing that everyone does and they do it normally loose leaf which is much cheaper to brew uh, and they do it brewed in your cups you don't have to have machines or anything for it and so it's a it's a quite a different thing and that's what they do as a morning drink so if we're doing a comparison between the different places and do it by choosing if we chose mate as as the starting point then the u.s and italy would both fare very poorly because we don't make mate available in the same way that they do in South America, not easily anyway. And if we were to then do a comparison of hot morning drinks, then we would have a very even comparison uh, across all of those countries. But if we don't 
change what we drink based on the country we're in. It may not matter for us. And so the idea of comparing those places is very difficult because there's not just the change in price. There's the change in culture, in tradition, in availability of ingredients, manner of, of presenting the, the drink in this case. There's so many potential factors, it really becomes extremely difficult to compare them, and you have to understand what exactly you're comparing. If you're comparing overall lifestyles, then you have to look at an even bigger picture, right? Do you eat breakfast typically in Argentina? Do you uh, sit and have coffee over long periods of time at a cafe with a view? Are you grabbing it in a paper cup to go? Is it a really expensive coffee, right? You have to be careful because in the U.S., you have two divergent coffee cultures. One is drinking unlimited bottomless drip coffee at the local diner. That's what I grew up drinking coffee like. But for a lot of people, their coffee is going to a Starbucks, for example, and having a specially crafted, very exquisite coffee. And of course, it's going to cost more because you have an artisan putting effort into it. And if the culture of the place you're in is to have that, that barista creation then your cost of coffee is going to be higher. But it's probably a process that's going to take more time. It's a more important part of your day. It may be part of a ritual. And how do you compare that to someone going to the diner and getting a plate of eggs and toast and getting a coffee for 59 cents to go along with it? That was what it cost when I was a teenager. It probably costs more now. But you get the point. They're very different things. And how do you take what is the culturally accepted behavior in one country versus another? Uh, how do you compare the different types of drinks? And how do you compare it, how it applies to you? Because what matters to me in many of those cases, I will happily drink espresso in Italy, drip coffee in America, and mate in Argentina. No problem at all. I will adjust, and so I'm getting the cheap thing because I want to do what's cultural in all those places. I'm also not caffeine addicted. Nah, maybe for a couple days, but I get over it pretty quickly. But if you're someone who wants to recreate their drip coffee from the United States in those different places, then your way of evaluating what matters to you will be totally different than how I would evaluate, right? Mine is recreating a cultural experience, meaning I want to do more or less the same component of the different local cultures in the way that people locally would do it. As long as it's something that I enjoy, I do enjoy mate, I do enjoy espresso, so it all works out just great for me, right? But if that's not how you are, you like your Starbucks experience, then you're going to need to find what it costs to recreate that. So what's important from this bit of the conversation is what it costs to live in a place is personal. It is not something that you can, you can to some degree, right, say that, oh, Nicaragua costs less than the U.S. Well, that's a good starting point, but... It isn't necessarily cheaper for you. I've never met a person for whom it's actually more expensive. It's normally so much cheaper that it's it's just a question of is it 10% cheaper or 100% cheaper? Well, it's never going to be 100% cheaper, but is it 10% or 50%? I guess in the other way, it could be 100% more expensive. So that's important to, to understand that these evaluations, anything you see that isn't personalized to you is going to be a very rough number, and you can't expect to see those results necessarily yourself. You might. You might just hit that number and be like, yeah, this was really representative. And it probably is relatively representative for the average person. That's, that's reasonable. We don't generally see a wild divergence, but we do see people having a mix of trying to recreate. And I mean, individuals have this mix of some parts of their lives they will try to recreate and other parts of their lives they will try to adapt to the local culture. That's normal. There's things that we really enjoy from wherever we're coming from. And there's things that we find that we enjoy in the places that we're going to. And of course, some things we may not enjoy quite as much, but they cost so much less. They're so much easier to do. They're so much more easily available that we adjust to them. For example, I moved to Nicaragua and discovered that I really like gallo pinto, I adjusted to that. So instead of having toast with breakfast, I have gallo pinto, which is beans and eggs that's flavored. Uh, and that is available everywhere and is super cheap. But if I demanded that I always have toast instead, then toast and butter are both a little bit more expensive, totally affordable and probably still cheaper than in the United States. But their cost would be much higher than eating gallo pinto. So your cost of food here could heavily be determined by how much you adapt to what locals eat because it's readily available, uh, prepared everywhere, and very affordable. Second part of this pricing discussion is understanding the difference between the price of an object in the country and the amount you pay for an object when you live in a country. Let me give a solid example. If you need to buy a laptop here in Nicaragua, if you go to the local store, chances are the price is going to be 
pretty high compared to what you're used to. I don't know where you're coming from, so maybe it'll be low for you, but for most people, Nicaragua's electronics are relatively expensive. This is generally well known and expected. We're a tiny country, it's a tiny market, we have uh, no direct access to, to anyone shipping in a large number of computers. There's just a lot of complications that make computers a specifically expensive item here in Nicaragua. This is exacerbated by what I'm about to explain. So if you're a person who just goes to the, one of those stores, you're going to look at the sticker and say that's higher than I would normally expect. So now you're going to sit down and look at your, your cost of living sheet and say, oh, electronics are quite high. To some degree, that may be true. And if you're looking at a giant TV, that would be more meaningful. But when you're looking at a laptop, you have to say, but do I have another way to buy it? And the answer is yes. You have three key alternatives that most of us leverage at one time or another. One is most of Nicaragua lies really close to Costa Rica. So if you want to just go to Costa Rica and take advantage of their larger electronics market there and easier access to product lines, you can just drive down or potentially fly down and go shopping there. And of course, Nicaragua is perfectly happy to let you have a certain, you know, can't go down and start a store by buying a whole bunch of electronics in Costa Rica. But if you just need to get a new laptop, absolutely, you're welcome to go down, buy a laptop and come back with it, no problem at all. And you will potentially get better selection and potentially lower price. So that Costa Rica or even Panama are really close and markets that we're able to leverage for our own purchasing makes life relatively easy. A lot of people do that for a lot of products, especially if you're already doing something like border runs or you like doing vacations in Costa Rica like many of us do. It's a beautiful country with a lot to offer. Why not do some shopping while you're there? Nearly everyone who goes into Costa Rica also makes shopping a major part of it. I mean, let's be honest, when you're traveling anywhere, shopping is often a major component of your travel experience. That's just something people often do while traveling. But in this particular case, this is a situation where people sometimes use shopping as the goal of their travel or a major component of it, not just a casual component of it. So that's one way that we all alter our cost here in Nicaragua. So when you look at what Nicaraguans are actually paying, it starts to be lower than what the stickers are at the store. Maybe not hugely cheaper because you got to get to Costa Rica, but if someone's going there already or you have a friend that's going and they can pick it up for you, quite often there's no actual noticeable additional overhead. So you may see actually lower prices. The second thing that people often do is simply shop somewhere else and ship it. This is basically like just normal shopping online. There's a little bit more logistics that you have to deal with, but once you do it once or twice, you're used to it and it's just normal life and not something you have to worry about. So there's lots of services that bring products into Nicaragua and they do it based on different regimes. Some do it based on weight, some do it based on the item, some do it based on the cost of the item. Like there's, they're all over the place and you just find one that makes sense for you, one that you like, and you can then order from someone like Amazon or Micro Center or Best Buy or Walmart, have the product at the super low US prices because the U.S. does get some of the best prices around. They have a huge market with low tariffs on electronics. Often those things are made in the United States and have them sent directly to you here in Nicaragua. You're going to pay a premium over getting the same product directly in the U.S. and not having to send it on to Nicaragua, obviously. Hopefully that is obvious. But often the shipping cost is very low. Uh, the bigger thing that is a penalty is often the delay. In the United States, you often would get a laptop the same day or maybe tomorrow. But if you're here in Nicaragua, well, you could pay a lot to have it shipped in in just a few days. Typically, people wait a week or two and get it really cheaply. But the important thing there is, yes, we've added some delay. That does not increase your cost of living. It does increase your annoyance of living. But you have to determine how much that affects you. Some people, that's major. Some people, it's just not a thing. So you may wait a little bit longer, and you're going to pay a small amount extra. But in many cases, the amount you're paying extra is absolutely tiny. And sometimes there's a tax advantage only sometimes uh, that may end up offsetting some of that. Rarely would it offset all of it, but it could offset it a little bit over being in the United States. Sometimes by being able to order online in that way, you're actually able to save a little bit on your taxes uh, and not have, because you're not doing, there really isn't a sales tax component in some cases. So that that's complicated, but you really can end up getting electronics quite cheaply. And then the, the third major mechanism that a lot of people do, and this applies, those first things apply to nearly everyone, including Nicaraguans. The third one, applies generally just to expats once in a while Nicaraguans but very much only to the expats and that is if you're going to be traveling to a place that has low cost electronics not Costa Rica that's the local like running over the border thing we kind of look at one way and if you're traveling to another place like you're going home to the US going home to Canada England Germany something like that maybe to you know Taiwan China uh, Thailand, you have countries that have big selection of very low cost items and if you happen to be going there or you have a lot of things you need to buy and you just make a special trip, 
Let's calculate this really quickly. You're gonna buy a bunch of stuff. Well, going to the United States from Nicaragua can be as cheap as $30 and practically it's more like 60. You're gonna need luggage in many cases, but not all. In a lot of cases, I fly up and only take a backpack. I'm just not dealing with that much stuff. It's often just electronics, a camera, something I wanna be holding anyway. I'm worried about the, the damage of it being thrown around or something. So I wanna take care of it, right? A laptop, an iPad, any of those kinds of things. Uh, I can fly to the United States for $60. I can then buy whatever I need, new batteries, cables, laptop, iPad, whatever, buy all that stuff, put it in my backpack and fly back. Suddenly I just spent $120 round trip. Now, if you're taking a GoPro, right? And saying, okay, this is a $400 GoPro. I just added $120 to its price. That doesn't make any sense at all. That's a huge percentage, uh, like a, like, 30% um, and would make it completely impractical. For that, you would ship it in from someone, right? Or go to Costa Rica and just buy it there. The prices are much better if you do that. So you learn different things have different processes. But what if I was already going to the US and buying a laptop, getting an iPad, getting some new batteries, a few extra things, and a GoPro was just, since I'm there, I'm adding the GoPro as well. Suddenly, I'm still only spending $120 a round trip to go to the US. That may be my border run as well for a lot of expats. So that may be something I'm already doing. And then you can calculate that price as just something you're already doing, just leveraging the fact that you're gonna be in the US. Maybe you're visiting family, maybe you're going up for Christmas, maybe you're going up to deal with a driver's license renewal. Since you're there and you can't avoid being there, which is generally the case for a lot of expats, not everyone, certainly, but you do these things, you end up there and then you go and do some shopping. And a lot of expats do this. And so because we do this, we often are getting near or even exactly U.S. prices on the things that we are getting to live in Nicaragua. And so our realistic cost of items is not nearly as high as the stickers in the stores would tell you. But for someone, they're only going to shop that way. They're unwilling to go to Costa Rica. They don't know how to order online and just won't do it. They're, they're, gonna fly, they're not going to fly to the U.S. or travel anywhere ever. And so the price at the store is the only thing they're willing to do. Well, if that's who you are, on one side, you have to be fair and say, Okay, but you're creating the high cost. It's not the high cost of Nicaragua in that example. Um, but if that's how your life is going to be, then you'd have to calculate w where would you be willing to shop in the U.S.? What are the prices and do the comparison that way? And yes, Nicaragua will then cost more in that one particular item instance, right? But that's real. But for the majority of us, the real world prices of most goods, and keep in mind, in the example, the person who's never willing to go anywhere, if you had a friend that was going somewhere and they could pick things up for you, which is a really common thing as well. Oh, you're gonna be in the States. You know what? I got this GoPro that I wanted to get. Can I just have that shipped to your hotel? Sure, it's a tiny thing. Slip it in your bag. It comes with a little case. Just pop it in there, throw it in your bag, bring it to me. Suddenly, you're getting your GoPro at US prices, no extra fees whatsoever because no one's charging you for throwing it in their backpack. And it's something that they're allowed to bring in. It's not a problem. They're not skipping anything. They're not getting away with anything. They could, you know, you could tell the Nicaraguan government, the American government, hey, I'm going to order a GoPro. It's going to go to, you know, uh, my friend's place in Louisiana. He's going to throw it in his backpack. He's going to come through customs with it. And he's going to hand it to me when he gets here. And every single person from the US to the border control to Aduana or customs, all those people would say, Yep, you don't need to tell us about that. Like, that's just how it works. You'd be like, excellent. No one's skipping the taxes. No one's skipping customs. No one's skipping anything, right? So that's a really common approach. Even for those people who are unwilling to do anything, it is really common with a little bit of forethought, a little bit of planning, a little bit of thinking outside the box, as we said in another episode, you can often get the American shopping experience here in Nicaragua. Now, if you live in some place that's much farther away, let's say Paraguay, for example, uh, you have some challenges. One is it only has expensive flights to places that have low-cost shopping in most cases. It generally doesn't have too many places that you can drive over the border and get lower prices. Most of its borders are against countries with pretty high prices. You might get better prices than you get in Paraguay, but it's not likely because Paraguay has some pretty decent prices internally to start with. It needs them because these alternative processes are very difficult. You can probably ship into Paraguay about the same as you can ship into Nicaragua, but shipping to Paraguay is much farther for most places. And since it doesn't have any ports of its own, it's generally a bit more expensive just to do that. So expect to have a premium on that, but overall, probably not a big deal. 
but having people who are routinely flying places that you are routinely flying places because of its incredible distance from everywhere makes that much less likely. It could still happen, but you have to factor those things in. Can you just drive to a neighboring country to get lower prices? No, they would drive to you. Can you fly to the US? Well, you could, but it's $1,000 instead of $60. Not that it's actually 1000 you could shop around, but you get the point. It's a much more expensive flight, often multiple flights, often multiple days, as opposed to from Nicaragua, it's just two hours up, do your stuff two hours back and you're done. So it can be a different world. But the evaluating these things and understanding the big picture of your pricing is important. Same thing with cars. In the United States, you won't get an all-electric car. They're easily available, but the value, uh, the value cars, those that have good prices, have 100% markup on them. So you, Americans can't even begin to get good deals on cars. Cars that should be $9,500 are $18,000 in the U.S. That's insane. So Americans pay huge premiums to get electric cars. You may ask, well, what is the electric car in Nicaragua? Well, we don't sell any. So you, in one side, you could say they're not available. That's an unlimited price, right? It's like it costs infinity amount. And that's a valid way of looking at it. But what does the average Nicaraguan pay for an electric car? Oh, well, a lot less than the U.S. because we easily have access to markets outside of the borders where we can buy them at literally half the price of the United States sometimes get that tax free and just drive it across the border completely legally and we're able to do that. So suddenly our cost of getting a car could be really good compared to the US, but the cost of the sticker at a showroom may be higher or similar or not exist at all. And that will give you, depending on what you're asking, very different answers. So the important thing is to one, evaluate these things as they apply to you. And you may not know all the factors, but you need to be thinking about how they would apply to you, not just looking at blind numbers, because it doesn't tell you as much as it seems. It may be useful as a starting point, but it's not as meaningful as people often assume. And also think outside the box and say, how would this actually apply to me? What would I actually do? How would I actually approach it? Uh, or how could I? Um, and, and what does that actually make the price rather than contriving a scenario that people may not actually do? And it's very similar to the this just isn't how people shop in Nicaragua, right? The way you shop in the United States is different than the way you shop in Nicaragua, just in the same way that the Americans drink a drip coffee and Italians drink espresso. They're doing two different things based on what they like, based on what their national history is or just whatever. And so when you take the cultural uh, artifacts into consideration, whether it's your drinks or your laptop, it really gives you a different perspective on how much it actually costs to live somewhere versus what a contrived action would be that you need to do for a direct comparison. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help me buy laptops and coffee and all that, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And as always, I will see all of you tomorrow. And take a moment, click on one of the videos either on the screen, that'd be fantastic, or scroll down, pick one of the ones from down there and, uh, you know, Help support the channel by telling YouTube that this content has driven you to investigate further.